So good morning. Um, you'll pardon a Frenchman trying to put an Italian spin on these names. They are, they're very definitely Italian, so you'll pardon my attempts at uh, use, uh, saying the names and as close to uh, an appropriate pronunciation as I could find. Anyway, um, again, my talk is on Blessed Luigi and Maria Beltram Quattrocci. Not bad, quattrocci. You know, you get the, get the roll of the R's there. Let's begin in prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and we shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. On October 21st, 2001, Pope St. John Paul II said this, as part of his address at the beatification ceremony for Luigi and Maria Beltram Quattrocci at St. Peter's Basilica and Square. He said, quote, Maria and Luigi were beatified as a married couple. They are not clerics or religious. They are lay people, and they are married with children. They symbolize all married couples who have lived and still live today in their married life the holiness, which is the call of all Christians. He goes on to say, this couple lived married love and service to life in the light of the gospel with a great human intensity. With full responsibility, they assumed the task of collaborating with God in procreation, dedicating themselves generously to their children to teach them, guide them, and direct them to discovering his plan of love. From this fertile spiritual terrain sprang vocations to the priesthood and the consecrated life, which shows how, with their common roots and spousal love of the Lord, marriage and virginity may be closely connected and reciprocally enlightening. Drawing on the word of God and the witness of the saints, the blessed couple lived an ordinary life in an extraordinary way. Among the joys and the anxieties of a normal family, they knew how to live an extraordinarily rich and spiritual life. So St. John Paul II spoke eloquently of the foundations of our culture of married love, of that which is the call of the majority of us, the call to serve one another in marriage. Let's talk then about Luigi Beltrame. He was born to Carlo and Francesca Beltrame Vita in 1880 in Catania, Italy. Catania is located on the east coast of Sicily at the base of the active volcano Mount Etna. So the island of Sicily sits at the toe of the boot and just below the toe of the boot, Catania sits there right on the ocean. Tough place to be born. Uh, at age 11, Luigi, at the request of his childless uncle, Luigi Quattrocci, and his wife, Luigi Quattrocci's wife, Stefania, was adopted by them and raised in their home. Luigi B., Luigi Beltrame, maintained a very close relationship with his birth family, but was raised by the Quattrocci, Luigi G., and wife Stefania. Luigi B. added his second name, second surname Quattrocci, at the time of his adoption. The story goes on that Luigi B. attended school in Ancona on the eastern coast of Italy, so 
Rome sits maybe three-fifths of the way, uh, half of the way up the boot, and Kona sits on the opposite side of Italy on the Adriatic Sea. So he attended school there, and um, from there, after graduating high, their equivalent of high school, moved to Rome to study Jewish, jurisprudence. Luigi B. was awarded a degree in law in 1902 from La Sapienza University. Sapienza, as it is known, is boasts graduates such as Enrico Fermi, um, the discoverer of the atomic bomb, Maria Montessori, uh, the famous educator, Daniel Bove, the discoverer of antihistamines, Charles Ponzi, yes, the scheme, <laughs> and many others. It would seem that Luigi B., Luigi Beltrame Quattrochi, was quite bright. An interesting fact about La Sapienza, it was established by Papal Bull, the university system of the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, of the Vatican, in 1303. So La Sapienza has been around for quite some time. Upon graduation from Sapienza, Luigi took a legal position with the Inland Revenue Department. Yes, the IRS. Of particular note, Luigi B. was not a very faithful Catholic at this point. He was known to be a man of integrity and honor, but certainly not much of a Catholic. Maria Corsini, who is Maria Beltrame Quattrochi, her maiden name, was born to Angelo Corsini, a captain in the Royal Grenadiers, and Giulia Salvi in 1884 in Florence, Italy. Florence is in the upper middle part of Italy, and it is the capital of Tuscany. Maria would live in many cities in Italy, among them Pistoria, Arezzo, and Rome, due to her father's military transfers. Maria's collateral family would boast a number of uh, intriguing Catholics. St. Andrew Corsini, who lived 1302 to 1374, and was Bishop of Fiosi, Fiesoli, excuse me, Pope Clement XII, who lived 1652 to 1740, and his reign was 10 years, 1730 to 1740. Um, he was born Lorenzo Corsini. And three cardinals, Andrea Cardinal Corsini, who died in 1795, Neri Maria Cardinal Corsini, who died in 1770, and Pietro Cardinal Corsini, who died in 1405. And so the Corsini family is a well-established uh, ruling class family in the Tuscany region. In fact, you can go on the web and you will find a Corsini website with tours of their estate and other uh, curriculum vitae of the family and its history uh, if you're interested to uh, understand uh, Maria's background. Maria was well-educated herself, uh, in large part by parish priests wherever she lived, um, and she followed a very rigid, disciplined, we could say, uh, life of study, prayer, daily mass, and communion. Maria's education would give her the credentials throughout her life to author books on religion, education, family life, and the spiritual upbringing of children. Maria would become a university professor of education. And in the articles I read online, um, there were seven books uh, listed uh, that she had written. Unfortunately, uh, I don't read Italian, so uh, I have not read any of her books. Um, Luigi B., and I'm going to drop the B at this point. I think we get the point that we're talking about um, Luigi Beltrame Quattrochi. He and Maria met at uh, the Corsini home in Florence. They both enjoyed uh, a rich life of literature, music, theater, the beauty of nature, and travel. So they met fairly soon after he graduated because when Luigi fell ill in 1904, their relationship had 
blossomed to the point where Maria sent an image of the Madonna of Pompeii to him and encouraged him to pray to her, to her for his healing. He was in fact healed, and this event cemented the love that they felt for one another, for one another such that on November 25th in 1905, they were married in the Basilica di Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome. If you've ever been, it's the cathedral church for Rome, the um, diocese of Rome. It's a beautiful, beautiful building. Um, during their early years, uh, Maria and Luigi would live with uh, parents and grandparents. Filippo, their firstborn, born in uh, October of 1906, would become a Benedictine priest taking the name of Don Tarsicio. Stefania, um, apparently uh, named after his adopt of Luigi's adopted mother, was their firstborn daughter born in March of 1908. Stefania would become a Benedictine nun taking the name of Sor uh, Cecilia. Cesare, the second son, was born in November of 1909, their third child, after a very difficult labor, which would be a precursor for things to come. Cesare would become a Trappist monk known as Father Paulino. <coughs> Excuse me. Enrichetta, their second daughter and last child, would be born in April of 1914. Maria, during the pregnancy, would be diagnosed with placenta previa. The doctors would recommend that Enrichetta be aborted to save the life of the mother. Luigi was counseled that he would be raising three children on his own. Luigi and Maria opted through prayer, good counsel from their spiritual directors, and faith in God to carry the baby as possible to term. Again, 1914. Maria was induced prematurely in the eighth month. To us, my gosh, the eighth month is, is full, nearly full term. This is 1914. In the eighth month, an Enrichetta and the mother survived the birthing process. They credit prayer, their fasting, their counsel, and goodwill of God for Enrichetta and mother's survival. Maria and Luigi would serve the, their family and the community. They were members of the Third Order's regular of St. Francis of Penance, who are men and women who choose to follow more specifically and specifically the teachings of St. Francis of Assisi. With service to the poor, almsgiving, prayer, and fasting as part of their normal way of life. Luigi and Maria's children would attest to the faithfulness of their adherence to that rule. The normalcy of that rule would be interspersed with joyful times as family, however, uh, as is the promise of the gospel, and they would live lives of uh, richness and fullness of hiking and, and uh, kayaking and outdoor sports, as was the want of both Maria and Luigi, and their children would uh, speak of that uh, during the process of investigation. Luigi and Maria were also m members of the Associazione Scouts Cattolici Italiani, the ASCI. It was the scouting organization that was uh, present in Italy, and it survived from 1916 to 1974. However, it was rooted pretty deeply in fascism, which was led at the time by Benito Mussolini. That was his early rise to power. And so fascism would be developing and growing in uh, Italian politics at the time. The Quattrochis would rebel against the fascist model of life and would leave the ASCI formally, but begin their own version of scouting and lead scouting for children in Rome on their own. They were also members of the Azione Cattolica, the biggest lay Catholic movement in Italy. And it was a non-political organization that sought to influence society towards Catholic thinking. 
And finally, it's recorded that they were members of Unitalsi. This is an organization that would <clears throat> work to carry the infirm to lords and other pilgrimage sites for the people to be blessed by the pilgrimage event. It is noted that Maria worked for the Red Cross during the Second Italo-Ethiopian War, which raged from uh, October 1935 until February 1937. Not necessarily the finest thing. Uh, it was a war of conquest of Italy over Ethiopia and conquest and domination. It was the time, however. Maria would serve the Red Cross. Maria would serve as a volunteer nurse during World War II. I found nothing, interestingly enough, uh, about World War I and their uh, efforts in World War I. Arguably, they were raising their children. But understandably, they were, part, they were participants, um, as it were, in World War I as well, having grown up through that time period. And finally, as a comment to their efforts during World War II, Luigi and Maria would open their home in Rome to Jews, to refugees, to anyone who would come uh, to, their, to their abode for care and um, service. So let's look a little bit at their philosophy in raising their children. Luigi and Maria adopted the mantra from the roof up. And what that meant to them is everything needs to be looked at from the standpoint of your end game, your end game being heaven. In her 1952 book, Radiography of a Marriage, Maria says this, and I quote, since the birth of our first son, we began dedicating ourselves to the children, forgetting ourselves. In order to love our children more, we tried to better ourselves by correcting our shortcomings and improving our characters. We both felt the tremendous responsibility in front of God, who had entrusted the children to our care and of our country that expected loving citizens. Educating children is the art of all arts and brings along serious difficulties. But one thing is certain. As two bodies in one, we both aimed at their best, ready to avoid everything that could harm them. This implied some personal sacrifices. The joy of dedication to our children compensated everything because that joy was God's joy. In that effort, it's recorded that for 20 years, for more than 20 years of their marriage, they would receive spiritual direction. Two particular priests were called out, and Father Matteo Crawley, in particular, would participate in the very life of the family in that he would dedicate an image of the Sacred Heart enthroned in their home uh, early on in their marriage. And so from early on, the marriage was dedicated to the Sacred Heart. And with that comes other spiritual disciplines such as the recitation of the rosary daily with the children, daily attendance of mass and reception of communion, and in fact, when they were able to afford the building of a, a new home in Cerevale, they received a authorization to build a small chapel and enthrone the Blessed Sacrament within their home. Really, quite an amazing, quite an amazing uh, permission. In particular, it was mentioned in the readings that I did do is that gossip, resentment, and bin I'm sorry, bitterness was banned from the home. Absolutely banned, wasn't permitted. And again, what I read of the children's testimony, that was absolutely the case. And so you can gather from this that Maria and Luigi had a full intention to live the path of holiness that is prescribed by our Holy Mother. A couple of quotes from uh, some of the children. Enrichetta, who would care for um, Luigi and Maria for their entire life, said that they would resolve their disagreements in private. Mom and dad would always display a spirit of harmony and unity. 
she would say that they were in tune with each other. Filippo, or Don Tarsicius, would say, one of, one of his quotes was, the aspect that characterized our family life was the atmosphere of normality that our parents created in the constant seeking of transcendental values. Arguably, he's saying, the achievement of heaven is normal. Younger son Cesare, Father Paulino, recalled, there was always a supernatural, serene, and happy atmosphere in our home, but not excessively pious. No matter what the issues facing us, they always resolved it by saying that it had to be appealed to heaven, the heavenly perspective. What's the goal? So the children would testify that the parents lived out this idea of from the roof up. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Luigi Beltram Quattrochi, having lived through World War I and World War II, would continue their daily lives of service to, their, to one another in their immediate world, as they had been called. And in 1951, after a day of hiking, Luigi would die of the effects of a heart attack uh, on November 9th in 1951. Before dying, however, the entire family, which by luck happened to be in town in Rome, Father Tarsicio, Sir Cecilia, Father Paulino, Enrichetta, and Maria would reconsecrate their family to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Luigi was remembered and is remembered as a man of great ability, integrity, and virtue. After his healing from the Madonna of Pompeii, he would become a very strong and faithful Catholic. And that virtue would shine through in his work effort, and he would receive many awards and professional honors, none of which I could find a record of, because he wouldn't allow it. He would refuse positions of higher authority, particularly if they would impact his duty to God and family. Luigi was a man of faith and love for his family. Maria Quattrochi. After Luigi's death, Maria would continue with her work as an educator and writer on matters associated with the family, couples, and education of children. She became a university professor. She would spend more time in contemplation and prayer. And finally, in August of 1965, Maria would die in the arms of Enrichetta just after reciting the Noon Angelus. There are, of course, some miracles recorded um, for the beatification and canonization steps. The beatification miracle was the healing of, quote, bone alteration of Gilberto, Gilberto Grossi, a neurosurgeon. It's pretty well documented then if it was the healing of a neurosurgeon was accepted by St. Pope John Paul II in um, July of 2001. They were beatified, as I mentioned earlier, in, on October 21st of 2001, and three of the four children would be able to attend the ceremony, which Sarah Cecilia, having died in 1993, she attended just in a different way. Father Tarsicio and Father Paulino would con celebrate the beatification mass with St. John Paul II, and Richetta would attend as a honored guest. Currently, there is a second miracle uh, being investigated for the canonization. The investigation ended in December of 2014, and if validated, they will be canonized as saints. I didn't find any update on that, given that it's 2018 at this point. Um, is it process-driven, or is it that the um, miraculous event was, has not been validated. I, I can't answer that. Nonetheless, um, there is evidence at least that um, their interceding to them is effective. Their relics uh, are currently entombed in the Sanctuari della Madonna de, del Divino Amore in Rome. Their legacy is there is an association, it's a long name, and I've been butchering the Italian, so 
et algebra ad diatsozione biati conigui Maria e Luigi Beltram Quatocci was founded in Pescara, Italy. So in Cona sits here, Rome sits here, Pescara sits here on the Adriatic just below Ancona. Um, the organization promotes the values and goals sought after by Luigi and Maria over the course of their lifetime, which are enumerated love of God above all else, faithfulness in your marriage, love of family, and service to the community. So what are the takeaways? Well, first takeaway I, I realize is our lives are bounded within the grace of God. Each of us has a particular call and role to fulfill in his plan. Most days, the grace flows like a gentle watering rain. We're seeing a lot of that lately, sort of the daily routine. And some days, it flows like a thunderous, a, a violent thunderstorm, a placenta previa pregnancy, and the, the advice to abort. What are we to do? How do we respond in those moments of grace? Well, Luigi and Maria's story shows us that trust in God's love is the ground on which we're to stand. Turn to him, believe his story. Second, life is intended to be rich. Rich in the fruit of our particular calling. When we seek God at his plan, he will reveal it and provide the necessary circumstances and grace to walk through it. Third, life is hard. The daily human grind takes its toll. Believe mother. Follow her advice. Serve and be served by the community, and the grind will produce fine, tasty flour. Fourth, marriage is indeed designed to change us. Sacrifice is required. Attitudes must be improved upon. Death is required, colloquially and physically. It is the flow. So, let the marriage vow, plan, and process be a vehicle for the road to heaven. Embrace God's plan as set forth for the vast majority of us, and you, we, too, will one day be sainted. We, not, we, we may not be sainted ecclesially, but we will in our heavenly home, our appointed goal. Amen. Anus Quitolis, <laughs> 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 <laughs>